This video is brought to you by Surfshark. Hello friends, my name is JJ. And if you're watching this channel, chances are high that you are a bit of a politics nerd. You like learning about world leaders and political systems and probably have some degree of insight into what makes say the French political system different from the Australian one. But what if I was to tell you there is a whole other underexplored realm of political systems out there? The realm of corporate politics. Corporations are of course these very big and powerful things these days and people like to go around saying that they have more control over the modern world than our democratic governments. But they also have a lot in common with democratic governments in the sense of being multi-layered decision-making structures complete with elections and executive branches and legislatures and all of the rest. So I've always found it a little bit odd that we don't talk about corporate politics more often, not just because it's relevant to modern life, but also because I think it is a topic that people interested in the other sort of politics will naturally find interesting and accessible. So today I thought I would do my best to offer a little introduction to the political systems of corporations. But before we get into that, let us just hear a brief word from my favorite corporation, Surfshark. Hello friends, so over the last few months you've heard me tell you all sorts of wonderful things about Surfshark, how it's an easy to use VPN app that lets you mask your true geographic location and trick the internet into thinking you are actually in one of over a hundred different countries, how using Surfshark to mask your IP allows you to bypass any online censorship legislation your government may have recently passed, as well as gain access to all sorts of exciting region-locked content, how when you use Surfshark your data becomes encrypted so you can feel safe and secure using public Wi-Fi, how Surfshark has the most inexpensive monthly rate of the big three VPN providers and allows you to use their app on an unlimited number of devices, how they offer 24-7 tech support and a 30-day money-back guarantee, and how subscribers of this channel can enjoy three months of Surfshark absolutely free if they click on the link in the thing below and use the promo code JJMCC. And I've spent months telling you guys all of this stuff for good reason. It's all true. So what's your excuse? Give Surfshark a try today. Okay, so when a business gets big enough, it will usually go public and start selling stock in itself on the stock market to the general public. Selling stock to the public is an important way that a company can make money, and buying and selling stock can be a good way for ordinary people to make money too. But going public also requires companies to embrace a form of corporate democracy, since US law requires stockholders to be given some formal say in how a public company is run, both as a check against corporate corruption as well as an extension of property rights. Because remember, owning stock literally means that you own part of that company. All public companies are required to have at least one stockholders meeting a year where the heads of the company will talk about how things are going and publicly disclose a bunch of information about how much money the company is making and all of that. And in most companies, the shareholders are also given an opportunity to vote on various things, say the adoption of a new anti-discrimination policy or whether or not they want to merge with a rival company. And the way that making these sorts of decisions usually happens is based on the principle of if you own one share, you get one vote. Shareholder democracy isn't completely analogous to political democracy, however. Since it is of course possible to buy multiple shares of stock, people who own a ton of shares in a company will have way more democratic power than people who only own a couple. To cite one theoretical example, let us say that the richest man in the world decided to buy all of the stock of a certain company. He could then use that power to proclaim himself techno king and abolish all future selling of stock. It could happen. But even if things rarely get that extreme, many companies do tend to have large chunks of their stock owned by a single rich person, family, or especially a large financial investment firm. According to this 2018 report from the Harvard Law School Forum on Corporate Governance, 70% of all stock in the US is owned by institutions, in fact, while only 30% is owned by individuals. So this means that when we talk about shareholders of a large company voting for this or that, 
We are usually talking about a bunch of organized groups rather than thousands of individual voters. A good analogy to this would be the US Electoral College. In a typical large company, all of the various institutional investment firms will usually only control like 5% or less of the overall shares each. So in theory, in order to win a shareholder vote, you need to cobble together a majority coalition amongst these groups in the same way that a presidential candidate has to cobble together a majority of states. US law likewise requires the shareholders to elect a board of representatives of some sort to exercise some degree of oversight over the management of the company. How competitive the elections for these things are tends to vary a lot depending on how good the company is doing. If the company is very profitable, the shareholders usually just re-elect everyone unanimously. But if times are bad, the elections might be more competitive and contentious. But beyond that, companies have a fair degree of freedom to decide exactly how they're going to run their internal affairs, and different companies will have different opinions regarding what system of corporate government is best. And this too is a lot like normal politics in the sense that some countries think that a strong leader is better than a weaker one, and some have more checks and balances than others, and some have more rules in place to prevent corruption and so on. So now let us compare and contrast some of those different structures in four of America's largest corporations. All right, so public companies have two basic documents that form what we could call their corporate constitutions, their certificate of incorporation, which describes how their stock works, and their bylaws, which describe their system of governance. And just like real governments, you will only get a complete picture of how everything works in practice if you also track down all of the individual policies that their governance bodies have made over the years, which outline their decision-making procedures in finer detail. For example, a company might have passed a corporate policy at some point saying that their CEO has to have a master's degree or something of that sort. You know, defining something narrow and specific that the bylaws, which tend to be more general in nature, doesn't explicitly mention. But since I don't have unlimited time for research, for the purposes of this video, we are just going to focus on the rules that these four companies' corporate articles and bylaws force them to follow, or basically what sort of political system is the company using as its starting point and how much room for creativity do they have beyond that. Okay, so why don't we start with what is perhaps the most famous corporation in the entire world, McDonald's. Like many companies, McDonald's offers stock in two different flavors, common and preferred, with people that own preferred stock getting to participate in profit sharing, but we won't get into that now. What matters is that decisions made by McDonald's stockholders at stockholder meetings are made by a simple majority vote of all stockholders, unless a policy will explicitly affect the benefits of preferred stockholders, in which case the majority of preferred stockholders have to vote in favor as well, which is what the political scientists sometimes call a double majority. Ownership of McDonald's stock is pretty evenly distributed among many institutional shareholders, with their single biggest shareholder, the Vanguard Group, controlling 9% of their stock. The McDonald's board of directors consists of 13 people. Its exact size is set by the board itself, but it can't be smaller than seven or bigger than 15. They all serve one year terms and can be reelected forever. Board members get paid and are allowed to be employees of McDonald's, but no employee of the corporation shall receive any additional compensation or remuneration for serving as a member of the board of directors. When someone decides to leave the board, the board scouts for a replacement and then puts that candidate to the stockholders for approval. But if someone leaves midterm, then the board gets to pick an interim replacement until the next shareholder meeting. The shareholders are allowed to nominate their own candidates for the board as well. This is actually a new thing that all American corporations are now legally required to do, thanks to the famous Dodd-Frank Act, which you might have heard of. Once the McDonald board takes office, they elect one of their members to be chairman, currently a guy named Enrique Hernandez Jr. 
The job of chairman can be combined with other executive rank jobs at the corporation, but it currently is not. Exactly what the chairman of McDonald's does is sort of left vague by the bylaws, beyond a reference that he will see that all orders, resolutions, and policies adopted or established by the board of directors are carried into effect, and other such duties as from time to time may be assigned by the board of directors. The only other executive rank job that the McDonald's bylaws explicitly prescribe is a CEO who shall have active responsibility for the general and active management of the business of the corporation. The board formally hires him, but since the bylaws say he also has to be a member of the board, technically the shareholders elect him on the board's recommendation. The board gets to create any and all other executive jobs that the company needs, though it doesn't say that they have to hire them directly. Board meetings are regularly scheduled, but can also be called at any time by either the chairman, CEO, or at least two board members. Shareholder meetings are called by the board or by at least 25% of the common stockholders. So overall, I would describe the McDonald's political system as a pretty vanilla system of corporate governance for a major American company. They don't try anything particularly creative or unconventional, but instead mostly adhere to safe and conventional practices that are relatively common among large and successful American companies. And on that note, let us now look at the corporate governance system used by Nike, the beloved shoe and sportswear people. So Nike has a more complicated stock system than McDonald's with three different tiers of stock that grant the owners of those stock different types of voting rights. Owners of preferred stock only get to vote on policies relating to three big matters, the company's merger or dissolution, the sale of the company's assets, or the sale or assignment of the Nike brand. Then there are the common stockholders who are divided into class A and class B. While they enjoy the same powers when it comes to passing general policy, Things get a bit different when it comes to board elections. Owners of a Class B stock, which is the most common kind, only get to elect a third of the members to the Nike board of directors. And this is a kind of sneaky setup that is common in some companies that don't really trust their stockholders to make the important decisions. Nike was founded by a guy called Philip Knight, and when he set up this system, his family was able to immediately buy up all of the Class A stock, which then allowed him to more or less single-handedly pick the board of directors. And through his control of the board, he was able to get himself appointed as company president for many decades. Phil Knight is pretty old now, and it is possible that this whole setup will be re-examined when he dies, as is often the case in these sorts of situations. Unlike the McDonald's board, the Nike board has no cap on how big it can get. It is currently 14 people. Their board members also get paid, but unlike the McDonald's board, it is possible to get double pay if a board member is also a Nike employee. Nike's constitution mandates a bunch of executive officers and spells out their specific duties, unlike McDonald's, which, as you may recall, only required a chairman and a CEO. But Nike requires that there be a chairman, a president, one or more vice presidents, a secretary, and a treasurer. The president is given power over the general supervision, direction, and control of the business and affairs of the corporation, and has basically equal power to the board itself. On many occasions, whenever the bylaws mention something that the board can do, it is followed by the words, or the president. The president is hired by the board, but the other officers can be hired by the president. No one is automatically a member of the board, but the president and the chairman, who I interpret as being the president's right-hand man, gets to be on every committee of the board. Nike allows executive positions to be stacked. At his peak, Phil Knight was both president and chairman. Now, Phil Knight is broadly regarded as being one of the great business geniuses of American history, which is why the stockholders generally gave him a pass in spite of the rather authoritarian way in which he ran Nike. But let us now look at Meta, the company that runs Facebook and Instagram, where things have not gone quite so smooth. So Meta was of course founded by Mark Zuckerberg and he set up his company in a rather similar way to Nike. He also created two tiers of common stock, Class A and Class B, 
although in this case, the system is even more brazenly undemocratic. Holders of Class B stock, which there is less of, but Zuckerberg controls all of, are literally given 10 votes for every share of stock that they own. This not only gives Zuckerberg control over who gets elected to the board, but also a veto power over any resolutions passed by the rest of the shareholders, something which has been a source of increasing controversy as of late. Zuckerberg isn't as respected as he used to be, and Meta's future is looking a bit uncertain, but he hasn't been particularly receptive to shareholder criticism. At their most recent shareholder meeting, Zuckerberg vetoed all 13 shareholder policy resolutions, including one to end the two-tiered stockholder regime itself. Beyond that, Meta has a board of nine members serving one-year terms. The board appoints a CEO, CFO, and secretary, with the CEO given the power to appoint every other executive in the corporation. Meta executives can also be board members, though the only one that currently is is Zuckerberg, who is also chairman of the board. As chairman and CEO, one of Zuck's official duties is presiding over shareholder meetings, which I imagine is not one of his favorite parts of the job these days. All right, and lastly, let us look at Netflix. Netflix is in a kind of interesting place right now because they are in the process of adopting a brand new governance system because their old system was quite unpopular. But in the interest of diversity, I'm going to be describing their outgoing system, and maybe you can see why they are getting rid of it. One controversy has been that they use the so-called first-past-the-post or plurality voting system to elect candidates to their board. And what this means is that members of their board can get elected even if the majority of shareholders vote against them. The criticism is that this has allowed a lot of relatively unpopular people to get elected to the Netflix board, which in turn has lowered investor confidence in the company overall. The other big thing is that Netflix board members serve three-year terms rather than just one year, which is more common. They do have elections every year though, but only one third of the board is up for election at any given time. And since the board also gets to appoint new members if people leave office midterm, or if the board votes to make itself bigger, it is theoretically possible that the Netflix board could have multiple appointed board members who could serve for several years without having to face the shareholders. It is also very difficult to impeach members of the Netflix board. The other companies we've talked about allow shareholders to vote out board members at any time for any reason. But at Netflix, board members can only be removed for cause, which suggests some high standard of wrongdoing, and the shareholders have to vote by supermajority to boot them out. The Netflix corporate bylaws also require a supermajority shareholder vote to change the bylaws themselves, which is another reason reforms have taken so long to happen. At the executive level, the Netflix system of governance only requires two offices, a president and a secretary, both elected by the board. The Netflix president is a kind of weird office though. The bylaws say that the board can also appoint a CEO if they want, and the president only has power if there's no CEO. And if there is a CEO, the CEO is the president's boss. But beyond that, his duties aren't really clearly described. The president or CEO can appoint other executives, and an interesting check on their power is that the board can fire his appointments at any time. But what is most interesting is that in 2020, the Netflix board appointed a second CEO to co-govern with the first one, and that has been their system ever since. Their bylaws don't describe this, it's just something that the board dreamed up on their own. The fact that they didn't just appoint a president to help their CEO, like their system explicitly allows, suggests that it was important for them to have two co-equal executives rather than one that is subordinate to the other. Having multiple CEOs is unusual for a big corporation, but not unheard of. According to this article in Fortune magazine, the system is used by seven Fortune 500 companies. All right, so hopefully that was a somewhat interesting introduction to corporate governance. I will freely admit that this is not my greatest area of expertise, and. I hope it was clear that this was just a fairly superficial overview. Another way that corporate governance is a lot like political governance 
is that you'll never completely understand how things work in practice as opposed to on paper, unless you've spent some time on the inside. But I think that this is another reason why the news should cover the internal politics of corporations a bit more. I think we would all benefit from having a greater understanding of exactly how these extremely powerful and influential institutions decide the things that they do. But I want to hear what you guys think. Do any of these four systems strike you as particularly good or bad? Do you know any companies with a radically unique system of government? Let me know in the comments. Do not forget to check out Surfshark, and I will see you next week.